to share something with you that <clears throat> that um, several of the ministers and uh, practitioners posted on Facebook, and I just thought it was it, it's a metaphysical interpretation of the 23rd Psalm, and um, I really loved it, and so I'm going to I'm going to share that with you tonight. So. Um, The Lord is my shepherd. That's relationships. I shall not want. That's supply. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's rest. He leadeth me beside the still waters. That's refreshment. He restoreth my soul, and that's healing. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness, and that means guidance. For his name's sake, and that is purpose. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that is testing, I will feel fear no evil. That is protection. For thou art with me, and that's faithfulness. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's discipline. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And that is hope. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's consultation. My cup runneth over. That's abundance. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And that's a blessing. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That is security. Forever. And that is eternity. I really really like that. So I just wanted to share that with you. And now, I'm very excited to hear this tonight. Mm -hmm. The numbers don't lie, or do they? Please welcome Wade Waldridge. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, I'm going to use this mic today instead of the little <laughs> thing, because if you do that one, because I have a little bit of that cough going around, and I don't want to cough into the mic that doesn't have a, uh, let me set up here, one of those, one of those. Oh, can I have my slideshow up, please? There I am. And it works. There we go. So, this is kind of continues on some of the uh, other talks that I've that I've done over the time, talking about some basics of philosophy and thinking and stuff. And this one was based on a book that I encountered called Enumeracy. So it's basically Enumeracy is the number equivalent of illiteracy. And this book deals with a lot of issues that people have in how they think about numbers. And just to just to put everybody at peace, we're not going to do a lot of math tonight. We'll do a little bit of math, but we're mainly going to talk about some really interesting numbers. Um, I used to be like super good at numbers when I was 16. There I am. Uh, I was I was a senior in high school at 16, but I was going over to Cal State or not Cal State, uh, Santa Ana College, so I could take my first couple of semesters of calculus. And here is everything I remember about calculus: the derivative is the slope of the line, and the integral is the area under the curve. That's everything I remember about calculus. So now you are caught up with me. Uh, is there, what's my next, okay. Is anybody here good at math? Come on, any, somebody who's at least okay at math. Who's okay at math? Mary, okay, all right, okay. You wanna come up here and get my calculator so you can follow along? And uh, here I brought this. Everybody remember what this is? Who knows how to use one? Because you can check my answers as we go here if you want. No? Okay. <laughs> so, numbers have a bad rap. Rousseau said, England is a nation of shopkeepers. 
And what he meant by that is, oh, we're also, con we're also concerned about the little numbers here and there, that we're missing out on the grand picture of life. Well, he was French. And, hmm? Well, he was French. Well, yes. <laughs> And uh, Bertrand Russell, they, all, they always quote him as saying that, that uh, math is cold, cold and austere. But the real quote is, mathematics, rightly viewed, possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. A beauty cold and austere, yes. But anyway, I like Pythagoras. There is a geometry in the humming of the strings. There is music in the spacing of the spheres. So if you watch closely tonight, you might actually see where the god of order is hidden in math and some of these numbers that we're talking about. So yes, there's not gonna be a lot of math involved. Um, I was gonna go tell you my story about my department secretary that we used to have, that we used to, remember these expense reforms? Anybody yeah. still fill out expense forms? Wow. And you gotta add up all the numbers this way, and you gotta add up all the numbers this way, and they were supposed to match or whatever, and she would always add them up and they would, they would they'd always be messed up. <laughs> So my boss told her, next time you add up a column of numbers, I want you to add it up 10 times. So she comes back and says, okay, I added it up 10 times, and here are my 10 answers. <laughs> no, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Compare that, for example, to Carl Friedrich Gauss, who, when he was 10 years old, they were punishing the class by making the class sit down and add up all the numbers from one to 100, just to shut them up, keep them quiet, and and give them some penalty they had to do. So he sat down and he solved it in about 10 seconds. Uh, and he was the only one that got the right answer in the class. And what he said is like, okay, well, if I'm gonna add up the numbers one to 100, then I could say one and 100, and two and 99, and three and 98, all the way up to 50 and 51. And each of those pairs is gonna be 101, and there's gonna be 50 of them. So the answer is 50-50, 5,050. So if you have a relationship like that with numbers, it can be very useful to you. So, like I say, we're, going, we're not gonna do a whole lot of math. Don't get like thrown off by the, what you're seeing there. So, some of those you might remember. Does anybody remember, anybody remember? Who, who took algebra? Everybody take algebra? Everybody take geometry? Everybody take trigonometry? No? Everybody take statistics? Okay. So, one of the first things that the, the book in numbers you talked about is like, one of our problems with numbers is that we really don't have a good relationship even with scale, the scale of numbers that we're talking about. So for example, how many airplanes, not little toy airplanes, but how many real airplanes exist in the world right now? What's the scale of that number? Is it hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions? Everybody got a number? Shout out a number. Tens of thousands. Okay. Actual number, about 25,000. So whoever said tens of thousands, yeah, you're about on the right scale. How many cigarettes are smoked in the world each year? Are we talking millions, hundreds of millions, billions, tens of billions, trillions, quadrillions? Shout out an answer. Hundreds of millions or more. Billion. Okay. The correct answer is six and a half trillion. Whoa. Approximately wow. 18 billion a day. Wow. Right? Because we're especially bad at little numbers and big numbers. So who here thinks they're fairly unique? They're one in a million. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. If you're one in a million, there are 7,500 people uh, exactly like you on this planet. Because there's 7.5 billion people on the planet. So if you're one in a million, there's 7,500 exactly like you. So let's talk about millions and billions and trillions just for a second. How long ago, I might have flashed forward, you might have noticed it, how long ago was a million seconds? It was leap day this year, not quite two weeks ago. That was a million seconds ago. So how long ago is a billion seconds? Shout out a shout out a, 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 a date or a year. Month. A month ago? Okay. How about July third, nineteen seventy eight? Was a billion years ago, and Warren Beatty was on the cover of Time magazine that day. Everybody remembers him. Now, how long ago is a trillion seconds? Right. So. Hundred years ago. Hmm. Hundred years ago. 
pretty close, about 30,000 BCE. And uh, Neanderthals were just uh, being replaced by Homo sapiens at that time. So you see how these things compound on one another. Because it, it's easy, we just say, oh yeah, million, billion, trillion, yes. But each of those is a thousand times what it was before, and that accumulates. It's not a thousand, it's not, when I go from millions to billions, it's a thousand times. When I go to trillions, it's not like 2,000, no, it's a thousand times a thousand times. That it, and they keep increasing like that. And we're really bad at the small things, like atoms. So everybody remembers Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, mm -hmm. right? So everybody take a breath. You can let it out if you want. You can let it out if you want. Um, so what are the odds that the breath you just took contained at least one atom from Martin Luther King saying, I have a dream? Percentage wise, yell out a number. 99%. So yes, we are all connected. The answer is 99%. 99%. Because people don't understand, they, they see things like Avogadro's number, that's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and they don't know what 10 to the 23rd is. It's a really effing big number is what it is, what right? Avogadro's Every time you take a breath, you're taking in. You know I don't know what Avogadro's is. Oh, never, well, no, that, that, that's how many molecules are in stuff. Well, here's just something for scale for you. So let's take a virus, since everybody's talking about viruses these days. Oh, and I'll, I'll just warn you right now, we're going to mention no numbers having to do with coronavirus, okay? But I happen to already have this in my slide. The ratio of a virus to a human, size-wise, is the same as the ratio of a human to the planet Earth. No. Yeah. Yes. The ratio of an atom to a human is about the ratio of a human to the entire orbit of the Earth around the sun. See, we, we, we have no concept for these really small, really numerous things. It's hard to keep that in mind. It's hard to, to process that. This is Drake's equation. We're not gonna go all the way through the equation, but it, it, this is... Well, this is the equation that gets pulled up all the time when you say, what, is the, what are the odds that there is life on another planet that we can communicate to, right? So if you go through it, it's like, okay, what are the rates that planets are formed times what are the odds that those have, uh, excuse me, that uh, stars are formed. What are the odds that those stars have planets times what are the odds that that planet develops life times what is the odd that that planet develops intelligent life from life times what are the odds that it develops intelligent enough life that you can send radio signals out into the, to the universe times what is the amount of time out of the life of that solar system that you're sending radio signals out there so that something, some other intelligence could pick up on that. And if you multiply all the numbers together, what you'll find is that yes, there is intelligent life out there somewhere. There's 100 million stars in this galaxy, and there are 2 billion <laughs> galaxies out there. So yes, those numbers multiplied together somewhere for intelligent life. But they're so far away, and they're so distant in time, or so far away in time, that we'll never see them. So yes, there is intelligent life out there, and we have not been visited by it, or are not in communication with it. So yes, you can ignore your lizard overlords. Okay. So, what are we on next? Hello? Okay, this thing's singing. See, I waited too long. If you wait too long, this thing times out or something. No? All right, Gina, I'm gonna have to have you go next for me here. It was working a minute ago, and now it's not. Okay, next. Oh, great, the computer's locked up on me, even better. All right, do you want to try and uh, exit uh, PowerPoint and go back in? Oh, that's to get Kyrie on it, and get a 10-year-old get a on it, that'll work. <laughs> the computer locked up totally? Yeah. All right, well, this is gonna be a lot tougher if you can't see what I'm pointing at. I, I'll give you a couple minutes. In the first place, okay, so, Next, we are going to start and talk about a little bit about statistics. So I guess we'll go ahead and start talking about that while she's trying to clear that. 
Um, and we're going to introduce you into two numbers that you need to have a really good relationship with them. You've probably heard of them. They're called zero and one. Everybody familiar with zero? Yes? Everybody familiar yeah. with one? Okay. Because everything in, in statistics and probability is somewhere between zero and one inclusive. Okay? So, it, if you, you, it might be a percentage, it might be 75%, that's still between zero and one. It might be odds, it might be three to one, that's a percentage or a, a, a value between zero and one. It might be a, a decimal, it might be, you know, 0.667 is, is the probability that happened. But it's all between zero and one inclusive. What in the world is that? Okay. Anyway, so take this standard 52 card deck that's sitting on top of the piano. I need a volunteer to go up and pick a card and not look at it in that deck. Are we moving forward? Okay, let me see. Hang on, let me see if I can move it forward. Okay, I'm moving it forward now again. Let's see if we get past Drake equation. There you go, there's the two numbers you wanted, zero and one. Okay. Okay, you have a card and you're not looking at it. Okay, what are the odds that that card is a diamond? One in, one in four, correct, if anybody's at one in four. What are the odds that that card is a king? One in eight. One out of four. Wow, got, I gotta play cards with you guys more often. There are 13 different card numbers in the deck. So one in 13. So one in 13. One out of every 13 cards is a king. Right? So what are the odds that it is the king of diamonds? One in 52, which is one in four times one in 13. Okay, now turn over that card. Is it the king of diamonds? It is not. Okay, what, what is it? The queen of clubs. The queen of clubs, okay, you may put the card back. Uh, no, leave it, up, leave it up for a second. Okay, now, what are the odds that that card is the king of diamonds? Zero, excellent answer. <laughs> that is correct. What are the odds? Because events in the past don't have probabilities except zero and one. So here's, here's, the, here's the other tough question. What are the odds that that card is the queen of clubs? 100%. 100%. One. 100% is one. So, if there's a 50% chance of rain on Saturday and a 50% chance of rain on Sunday, then there is a 100% chance of rain this weekend. True or false? False. What is the chance of rain this weekend? 50%. No, it's a 50% chance on Saturday and a 50% chance of rain on Sunday. What's the, what's the? 75%. How do you come up with that? How do you come up with that? Well, it could rain. It, Basically, well, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into all of the probabilities, but if you don't, if you don't get these right, then you probably want to review some of that somewhere. But um, it could rain Saturday and Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, or neither. And, oh, and okay, and all of those are, are equally probable. Everybody with me so far? Yep, yes? No? And only one of those four possibilities which are all the same probability, only one of those is not raining. So it could rain Saturday or Sunday or both 75%. Okay. Here, we'll give you, an, we'll give you another test. This is normally done with Judy, and no, not that Judy. But this is, this is a fairly common... I, some of you who are in my other talk talking about cognitive biases might remember this. Here's what you're given. Judy is a 33-year-old unmarried, and is 33, unmarried and quite assertive. A magna cum laude graduate, she majored in political science in college and was deeply involved in campus social affairs, especially in anti-discrimination and anti-nuclear issues. Which of the following statements is more likely? Judy is a bank, A, Judy is a bank teller, B, Judy is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. How many say A is more likely? How many say B is more likely? The correct answer is A. Because if I take Judy as a bank teller and end it with anything, it's less likely. If I say Judy is a bank teller and has brown hair, that's less likely than that Judy is just a bank teller. 
If I say Judy is a bank teller and has 10 toes, that's still less likely than that Judy is a bank teller. Even though it's 99.9% .9 probable that she has 10 toes. So my bias is showing? Hmm? So my bias is showing? Yeah, well, no, what, what it is is that questions can be phrased in this way. Part of, the, part of the talk today is to show you numbers don't lie, but people lie with numbers. This isn't even with numbers, but just the way I phrased the question can be extremely misleading. And pollsters don't lie, but pollsters lie by asking the wrong questions all the time. A couple other statistical examples. Okay, the odds of, of any person sharing a birthday with another person are one in 365, right? Okay, so if I start bringing people into this room, one at a time, how many people do I need to get in the room before I have a greater than 50% chance that at least two of them share a birthday? Shout out a number. Obviously, if I get 365, it, theoretically, I could get 365 different. So it's gotta be less than 366, I'll give you that. That's gotta be greater than two. This one's not very obvious, oops, but the number is 23. 23. By the time I get 23 people in this room, I got a 50-50 chance, though there's not 23 people in here, or I might do the experiment. <laughs> well, you, but that's because... What's you have here, you already have that. What was the question? <laughs> Whatever number is here, you already have two people with the same Oh, okay, maybe we do. <laughs> okay, a couple other quick little statistical oddities. <clears throat> Either God exists or God does not exist. Therefore, the odds of God existing are 50-50. Yes or no? No anymore. Correct answer, no. Basically, that's undefined. There can be things that are undefined. Just because something is not known doesn't, doesn't mean that the odds of it are 50-50. Uh, and along those lines, for example, every time that I fly on an airplane, I always bring a bomb with me because I figure the odds of there being a bomb on the airplane are really low, but the odds of there being two bombs on the airplane has got to be zero. So, what? Good to know. You got that on tape? <laughs> okay, so this is where media and marketing, let's talk about media and marketing. This is where numbers don't lie, but people lie with numbers all the time. If you want to know, there's a book called How to Lie with Statistics. You could read that if you care to, if you're in marketing, like certain marketing hacks that I know, Kimberly. <laughs> so the first thing you should always look at on graphs, this is a graph, you probably can't see it very well. I forget, what did I get? Uh, over 100 million now receiving federal welfare, okay? But the first thing you should always look at the graph is what is it measuring, okay? So this right here, the bottom line of this graph is 94 million. And this is 100 million right here. Okay, so what they've done is they've lopped off 90% of the graph. The real slope of the line would look like that, but they lop it off on the picture like this so it looks like that, because that's a lot better graph. And you should also always look at why did they choose to start when they, when they chose to start? Because just by selecting which data you want to put on the graph, you can lie to people very well with it. So, how are the numbers expressed? So I'm gonna state the same number two different ways. Last year, uh, there were 325,000 burglaries in the United States. That sounds like a lot. There's 128 million households in the United States, so you have about a one quarter of 1% chance of being burglarized in any given year. Okay? So that, 325,000 sounds like a lot. A quarter of 1% chance doesn't sound like very much. But if you're in the, in the uh, business of selling home security systems, then you say, there is a residential burglary every 23 seconds in the United States. Call SafeWise, we'll make you safe. And here's my favorite, this is toilet paper math. Has anybody ever tried to figure, I'm, I'm not even gonna try to do this one. Has anybody ever tried to figure out the toilet paper math? <laughs> No, right? Example. These 12 rolls are this 54 rolls, but these 30 rolls are this six, are equivalent to 68 rolls. But ugh, I don't even want to go. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> All right. So to make it easier on you, I'm going to tell you some numbers that you can safely ignore. Are you ready? 
Three, bad things don't happen in threes. You can ignore that number. 13 is not an unlucky number, and 666 is not the mark of the beast. You can ignore any numbers that have to do with biorhythms or Mercury being in retrograde. You can just safely remove those from your, your consciousness, okay? You can also ignore the MSRP. Nobody pays the MSRP. The only thing, the MSRP is a marketing number. The only thing it's there for, if you have two cars and one has a higher MSRP, you'll probably pay more for that, but even that's not guaranteed because of whatever discount you might get. Same way, never pay the cruise brochure price. I don't know why, but the cruises are all marked up 100%. So if you're gonna pay 5,000 for it, the brochure price is 10,000, and they're gonna give you half off of that, and you're gonna get it for 5,000. Same way, you can ignore the EPA miles per gallon, especially now that Volkswagen confirmed that they cheat anyway. Uh, again, you could, if you had a car that had better, more, a higher number for this than that car, it probably is gonna do better for you, but even that's not guaranteed. So you can just ignore that number. Uh, here's a number you can ignore, IQ. Does anybody know the formula for IQ? Raise your hand if you know the formula for IQ. Okay, so if I, say I, if I say somebody has an IQ of 120, what is that, 120 what? Okay, well, here's the formula for IQ. It's your mental age over your chronological age times 100. So it's essentially how much, 100 is average, higher than 100 is better than average, and lower than 100 is lower than average. So. You know, if, if you've got somebody who's six years old and they test out that they have a mental age, the mental equivalent of a nine-year-old, they have an IQ of 150. Nine over six is 1.5 times 100 is 150. Now, as George Carlin pointed out, think about how stupid the average person is. And fully half of the people are stupider than that. But essentially, you can ignore the IQ. For instance, Let's take that six-year-old who tested as a nine-year-old. He's three years ahead. Well, when he's nine, if he has the equivalent of 12, then he has 12 over now. Now his IQ has dropped to 125. Now, if you take mine, let's say I had an IQ of 150, the number on the right, and my chronological age is 60. Well, that means I have the mental uh, age of a 90-year-old. That might be right. I might have an IQ of 150 now, <laughs> because I might have the mental equivalency of a 90-year-old. So it's just a completely useless number, and there are way better ways of measuring uh, way more types of uh, mental capability these days. So you can just ignore that one. Here's another one, because since it's 2020, everybody keeps talking about 2020. Can everybody read the fourth line down for me there? No, I'm with you. <laughs> P -E -T -F -E? No, L-P-E-D. Ooh, eight has a dirty word in it. Don't look at that. Anyway, uh, 2020, does anybody know 2020 what? Yes, the second number is, the, the first number is what a normal person sees at 20 feet. And the second number is how far do you have to be to see that? So if you see at 20 feet what a normal person sees at 20 feet, then you're 2020. If you have to be if, if, if you see at 20 feet what a normal person sees at 50 feet, like you don't see very well, that's 2050. So you see at 20 what they see at 50. So if you're 2015, that means you see at 20 what they see at 15, so you're better than average. But again, this is a completely useless number to say somebody has 2030 vision or 2040 vision. Your, your optometrist has a big old chart full of numbers that say exactly what's wrong with each eye and what, to, what the prescription is to put for your glasses. Nobody cares whether you're 20, 20 or not. So ignore that number. And here's a number that you can ignore, infinity. Infinity, as I covered in one of my other talks, is not a number, it is a concept, it is not a quantity. And there are no infinities in the real universe. You can challenge me later on that if you want to, there just aren't. All right, let's talk about a couple common misconceptions. Am I, everybody keeping up with me? Am I going to, I, I, I'm gonna cover like 30 or 40 things here. Everybody's only gonna walk away with like three of them. 
But, but if you want, I'll, I'll send you the, the slideshow if you want. After you can send me an email, I'll send you the slideshow. So let's fix a couple common misconceptions. The first misconception is that it's bad to be thought of as a number. It's really, really great to be thought of as a number. I'm so glad I'm thought of as a number. If I say my social security is 5621833354, which for the record, since we're on the internet, it is not. I made that number up, okay? Then that uniquely identifies me, correct? There's only one of those people. Even with my weird names of Wade and Woltridge, there's a, there's a website, it was down when I checked it yesterday, but it, it, used, it was called howmanyofme.com. And you could put in your first and last name and it would tell you, well, you have the 182nd most popular first name and the 206th most popular last name. And based on how many of those there are, this is about how many of, of, these, of this name that you can expect to be in the United States. And I have weird names, Wade and Woltridge, so there's only two of me, right? But if you're somebody like Hans Smith, Hans is a much more common name. Smith is the most common name. And there's millions of Hans Smiths. So if the Social Security office was identifying Hans by just Hans Smith, who knows which Hans Smith we're talking about? I'd much rather be identified as 5621833354. That will at least know what we're talking about. So that's one misconception. Here's another misconception. It's called the gambler's fallacy. The roulette table has been read six times in a row. Therefore, A, we're on a red streak, and you should bet red. Or B, we're due for a black, and you should bet black. Who says A? Whichever place I place my bet, it'll do the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Who says A is correct? We're on a red streak. Who says B is correct? We're due for a black. Both of these are completely false. That's, both of those are our forms of the gambler's fallacy. There's the form that says, because they're both exactly as likely. It doesn't matter what it's been the last six times. What it's been the last six times has no bearing on what it's going to be next time. You can flip a coin and get five heads in a row. It'll happen one out of every uh, one out of 32 times you flip a coin five times. <clears throat> Moving on. Oh, there's a slight variation on that from statistics is called regression to the mean, which means for something that's not a, a new a new category each time, uh, like red or black on the roulette table. So let's say, I, let's say I'm, I play a game and I average 2,000 points on that game. But I just had a really good game and I scored 3,500 points. So does that mean my next game, A, will probably be even higher, or B, will probably be worse? And the correct answer is B, it'll probably be worse. It'll probably regress to the mean. If I've had a really bad streak, then I'm probably, it's, it's probably going to, to come back. But that doesn't work for most gambling things. By the way, this is why movie sequels are always worse because of this. <laughs> right? The movie sequel is always worse than the movie it got made from, right? Because they only make the sequel of the really good movie, and then they make an average movie, and it regresses to the mean. If the first movie was crappy, they didn't make a sequel of it. <laughs> so it's not going to be better. Yeah. Right? Okay, here's another misconception called Simpson's Paradox, meaning you can't average averages. I don't know if you guys can read this well enough from where you are, yeah. but this is saying Derek Jeter in 1995 batted 12 for 48 for a batting average of 250. David Justice was 104 for 411 for a batting average of 253. The following year, in 1996, Derek Jeter batted 314 and David Justice batted 321. So you would, so, Justice beat Jeter in both of those years. And you would think that if you added those together, that David Justice would still have a higher batting average than Derek Jeter, but that you would be incorrect because you can't average averages. If you add the two numbers together in the two year period, Derek Jeter actually outbatted David Justice. And you can look, if you get the slideshow, you can go compare those numbers for yourself. And one more misconception. Correlation is not causation. On this graph, the x-axis is the number of pirates that appeared in any given year. 
starting from thirty five thousand and moving down to seventeen this is the global average temperature in degrees celsius so you can see that there's a significant correlation through the years between an inverse correlation in this case between the rising temperature and the number of pirates that exist therefore global warming is either killing off the pirates or the presence of pirates is keeping the temperature down. <laughs> right? Yes, correlation is not causation. Correlation doesn't even imply causation. Here's another one. You probably can't read this all that very well. The x-axis here is the number of metric tons of fresh lemons that are imported from Mexico into the United States. This axis is the total US highway fatality rate. So clearly, eating more lemons causes people to be better drivers or all the drivers that got killed off ate all the lemons. I'm not really sure, but, that, it, does, but it, does, it correlates very highly. If you see the points on the graph there, this correlates very highly. Okay? If you remember nothing else, remember correlation is not causation. Okay, ready for some cool number things? How long have I got? Oh my God, I'm just droning on like a madman here. Okay, here's a couple things that are cool. Okay, compound interest is cool. It's great to get, sucks if you pay it. Compound interest is getting interest on your interest and then the next year getting interest on your interest on your interest and so forth. If you have money in your IRA or your 401k and you're getting compound interest, that is awesome. If you owe money on your credit card and you're paying interest on your interest and then paying interest on your interest on your interest, that sucks. Don't do that. Oh, here's something called a square cube law. Uh, this is actually a wonderful little thing with numbers that I've always found fascinating. Basically it says that if you blow something up, larger or smaller, then the surface area, the cross section, will increase with the square of it, but the overall size will increase with the cube of it. Let me, let me give you an example. Let's say we take six foot Wade here, and we make an exact, we blow him up in all three dimensions, and we make an exact replica that's 12 feet tall, okay? That version of Wade will be four times as strong because the cross section of all his muscles will be four times as strong but he will weigh eight times as much because it'll increase with the cube. The weight increases with the cube, but the strength increases with the square. That's why all the gymnasts that you see are about this tall. Because if you start getting leverage out there on these larger bodies, it just doesn't fly. The physics don't work. So Galileo came up with the square cube law, and that's why we can't have giant killer robots. All right, here's something cool. Is everybody familiar with the Fibonacci sequence? Yeah. You probably remember this from math. That's where you take a number, okay, so it starts with zero plus one equals one, then you take the last number and the sum, and then one and one is two, one and two is three, two and three is five, three and five is eight, five and eight is 13, right? Everybody familiar with that sequence? Have you heard of it at least before? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, no? Yeah. Okay. But this is cool. If you take that number, and you start going one, one, two, three by three, five by five, eight by eight, 13 by 13, 21 by 21. If you take the Fibonacci sequence and you arrange it this way, then it becomes what they call the Fibonacci spiral, which exists everywhere in nature. And not only that, what's cool about the Fibonacci sequence is if you take the ratio of the last Fibonacci number to the one before it. And you start taking the ratio, like two over one, three over two, and you get up to about 34 over 21, you start to see it converges on a number, and it converges on the number 1.618 and change. And that number is called the golden ratio. You can also get, or phi, sometimes called phi, the gold, you can also get the golden ratio by taking any length Take this length and breaking it, breaking it somewhere, cutting it in half somewhere, such that the ratio of the overall length to the big side is the same as the ratio of the big side to the little side. That ratio is 1.618 to 1. 
Why is that significant? Well, that's two different ways you can get to that same number, by the way, 1.618, the golden ratio. And that's because that shows up everywhere in nature as well. That's the ratio of next size tree limbs to the previous tree limbs, or that's why the ratio of that to that and that to that and that to that is the golden ratio. Shows up everywhere in nature. I'm gonna skip right over this whole stuff that I was gonna talk about medicine because we're kind of running out of time. But if you wanna to talk to me after, I could. Oh, I would like to cover, uh, here's how to provide scam medical treatments. This was covered in the book in numeracy. Um, whoops. Uh, let's see. The rules are, first, always make sure you start with a patient who's heading downhill best if they're desperate. You apply the treatment, coffee enemas, whatever treatment of the day is. If anything good happens, then you take the credit for that. If they stay the same, then you say announce that you have at least stopped the spread. And if they uh, get, if the patient declines or dies, then you say the patient got there too late into your treatment. That way, the few people that survive will be wonderful testimonials for your treatment, and everybody else will be dead, and they won't tell anybody. So, all right, I'm going to end with the coolest numbers ever. We already covered the two cool constants, zero and one. Right, here's some things about zero and one, they're cool. The next coolest number is pi. Everybody remember pi, the circumference of a circle over the diameter of a circle? 3.14159265, whatever it is. Okay, here's some cool things about pi. It's the ratio of a, of a circle inside of a square and the volume of a sphere. The next cool number is i, little i because it's an imaginary number, it's the square root of negative one. Has anybody ever done math that included imaginary numbers, the square root of negative one? Okay. And the next coolest number is, is called the natural logarithm, which is 2.718, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I don't know if anybody did, remembers doing exponents, but we had logarithms, which were base 10, and natural logarithms, which were base e, and the, there's the formula for e at the bottom of that. Well, I knew all of those numbers, and I had encountered all of those numbers, there's your constants, 0, 1, pi, i, and e. And then I made an application to Google when I was looking for a job several years ago, and they had this question on the, on the application. What is the most beautiful mathematical expression and why? That's the kind of people Google hires, just so you know. Uh, and I, I, I thought that was a cool question. The best I could come up with was the formula, the formula for solving quadratic equations, which is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. But that's all I could come up with. But then I went looking for this because I wanted to know, well, what is the most beautiful mathematical expression and why? And you remember these, two, these five constants that seemingly have nothing to do with one another? They look like that. e to the power of pi i plus one equals zero. Euler's identity. Euler was a mathematician. This is called Euler's identity. This is the coolest equation ever. Takes five fundamental constants of the universe, puts them together into one equation. I'm not even gonna come close to explaining you why, but it's the coolest <laughs> equation ever. So in closing, numbers don't lie. People lie with numbers. Numbers can be cool. And if you look close, you can see the God in them. Thank you. Oh, wow. Yay. Sorry, I went on a couple extra minutes. Oh, there. that's all right.